Okay, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. We're starting just a few minutes early because Dr. Pierce and I were having such a fun conversation sort of backstage that I, I said, you know, we, we got to make this public. It's, it's, it's getting too exciting, getting too good. So I'm, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Kenneth Pierce, uh, who's got a wonderful new book out. It's a debate book called Is There a God? And you are engaging with Dr. Graham Oppie, a well-respected naturalist in this book, and engaging some of life's most interesting and fundamental questions. And I wanted to have you on to talk about some of the material in here and also just, yeah, get, you know, just explore any number of ideas. So yeah, Dr. Pierce, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. So before we dive in, and I think there's a, a lot of, of stuff that we want to cover and, and could cover, uh, this is your first time on the podcast. So some formalities are probably in order. Uh, how did you get into this philosophy business? Who are you? What do you do? All that sort of thing. Yeah, so um, I'm a, a lecturer in philosophy in Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. Um, my kind of areas are uh, early modern philosophy, that's 17th and 18th centuries, and philosophy of religion. And I kind of, um, I got into this as a, I got into philosophy as a teenager, probably like a, a lot of people do from, from two angles. One is just that I had a lot of religious questions that nobody could answer and after a while, I figured out it wasn't just that nobody in my little church in my small town could answer them. Um, it was a, a deeper problem than that. Um, and the second was that I read a lot of science fiction as a kid. And, and so I was always very into what if questions. And I kind of saw philosophy as exploring both of those things and trying to explore them in a careful and systematic way. Um, when I went on to, uh, to university, I kind of found that um, although, although I like a lot of the, the kind of methods and, and aims and what goes on in contemporary analytic philosophy, the people at least who are doing contemporary philosophy there um, were not so into these kinds of religious questions that I was working on and, and that kind of stuff. And they also, analytic philosophy stylistically tends not to emphasize big systems, right? It tends to emphasize narrower solutions to narrower problems. Right. And so I got into the 17th and 18th century because it seems like these people, in the book I reference Leibniz a lot, mm -hmm. it seems like these people were, were asking the same kinds of questions that I already cared about. Mm -hmm. And they were working on kind of answering them in as, as part of a big system, which is very appealing to me. Right. Um, and so that's how it kind of came about that I ended up as a scholar of 17th and 18th century philosophy, and then as approaching contemporary analytic philosophy of religion um, in a way that's informed by my 17th and 18th century sources. Yeah, very cool. Well, um, we actually just did a series on Leibniz's on the ultimate origination of things. So he's one of my great intellectual heroes as well. And it's very cool to see uh, the sort of Leibnizian influence in, in a lot of your work. So let me actually start with this. Um, Dr. Pierce, there's a section in this book. Obviously, I have my my disagreements with Professor Oppie on a number of things, as you do. We'll talk about that. But there's what I'm sorry, I don't have the page uh, set. I should have done this beforehand, so I won't have the quote exactly. But maybe you remember this. There's a statement from, by Professor Oppie that struck me as almost alarming and somewhat surprising, where I think it's towards the end of the book. He, he says that he doesn't think the stakes are that high in this debate. Do you, rem do you remember this? And yeah, I don't, yeah. I, and I don't remember you challenging that, but that's okay because it wasn't central to the debate. But it just struck me as, how how could that possibly be the case? How could, right? How could you think that the stakes are not high in the in this mm -hmm. like the most fundamental question of God's existence? And he said, well, as long as we care about climate change and stuff like that, and that just struck me as at least profoundly question begging, right, against the religious position. So I just maybe want to open with your thoughts on. Are there stakes yeah. in this debate? And if so, are they, are they high? Do you agree with Professor Oppie there? Well, so I think um, unlike some um, popular apologists for theism and Christianity historically and at present, uh, I think that atheists can be moral. I even think they can have pretty good moral theories. The yeah. foundations of morality is a really hard issue in philosophy, but mm -hmm. I think like, look, there are atheist theories that, that seem pretty promising, you know, and um, we th like and simplistic divine command theory is not great. I agree. So, so I think, I think you know, atheists can be moral and they can even have good moral theories. And I think that Graham and I 
would have a substantial overlap of agreement on what the most on kind of what the pressing practical problems in the world are. And so I see a lot of scope for practical um, cooperation, as it were, mm -hmm. kind of on on the, yeah, Graham mentions climate change. I think um, the thing that um, is important to understand here, of course, is that Graham is a reasonably confident atheist. And so what I think he has in mind in that uh, in that statement at the end is that um, the this kind of false belief that, according to him, theists have uh, needn't do much harm. Right. So some people like Sam Harris think that, like, you know, religion is out destroying the world or something. And, right. and Graham was disagreeing with that and saying, you know, sure, there are some religious ideologies and also some secular ideologies that are dangerous and destructive to the world. But belief in God as such need not be so. And maybe even for some people, they're motivated to, to be good people and make a positive difference to the world because of right. it. Mm -hmm. from, from the perspective of um, a theist, someone might think the same thing that like, obviously we care about metaphysical questions about the fundamental nature of reality and so forth. But someone might think that, uh, look, it doesn't make much practical difference. In practice, most theists wouldn't think that. And I wouldn't think that because most theists are committed to some form of religion, right? And, and if you are, if a person with a religious commitment, obviously that makes an enormous and profound difference to their, their life. Right. And exactly what's at stake in making the right religious commitment is something that there are a lot of differing views on, depending on your particular theology and your views about the afterlife and so on. Mm -hmm. but, um, but having the right religious commitment or lack of religious commitment um, is something that particularly if there's a right religion, uh, could be quite momentous in what's at stake. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of what I think is going on is that this kind of non-religious perspective, whether it's a theistic or an atheistic non-religious perspective, that is thinking that there is that kind of religious commitment is not the kind of thing we need. There is no right religion. Um, if you have that view, then I think it makes sense for you to say that there's not much at stake. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Right. But that again, that seems to just take for granted that the other view is <laughs> is false. Right. <laughs> and there's there are positions that I, I think are, are incorrect, even religious positions. But I would still want to say, well, I hope I'm I hope I'm correct about that, because it does seem like there's there's something at stake here if I'm wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So um, and I just want to start off by by noting, you know, I have a, a, a lot of admiration for Pro Professor Oppie, not just for his. Uh, sincerity and intelligence but he also, he's also you know he's he's not like a sam harris he's very he's very friendly to theists he thinks you, you can be rational as a theist right and, and belief in god and yeah like you said he doesn't think that all sort of the world problems reduce to religion or anything like that so even though he himself is a naturalist he's uh, he's sort of a friendly a friendly atheist in a ways that a lot of the new atheists aren't would, would you agree with that mm -hmm. yeah yeah and actually something that um our our uh, editor tyron goldschmidt um mm -hmm was kind of when, when he was recruiting the two of us for this volume and we were kind of talking about what the debate might look like and what, it, you know, one of the things that he thought would be different than um, many existing theist atheist debates that are already kind of available in book form and, and whatever uh, would be the friendliness. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I also am kind of on the like, um, Look, I think there are good philosophical arguments and and other kind of good reasons for endorsing theism, but um, philosophy is hard, and I could easily be wrong. And I kind of recognize how um, how difficult the issues are, and how many excellent philosophers there are who come to to different conclusions. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that kind of the friendliness of the discussion. Um, is a, a kind of distinctive selling point of this particular debate, you know? Yeah, and that's we're, we're very much dedicated to that here of trying to raise a level of, of discourse and really try to have very productive and fruitful uh, conversations, which I think this book really models. So, all right, with all the friendliness in the background, let's get into some disagreement, right? Because obviously you and Graham have arguments, right, of, of why you think your positions are correct. And it does seem to me, uh, we were talking about this a little bit before, that... Um, 
Yeah, there's sort of this sort of master argument that kind of um, is behind a lot of uh, Professor Oppie's thinking. And it's a very interesting argument. In fact, in fact, it reminds me of, of St. Thomas Aquinas, because when St. Thomas Aquinas is addressing like the two arguments against God, he's like, look, there's evil. And there's this idea that you just don't need God to explain anything, that the principles yeah. of nature are enough. And it seems like Professor Oppie just kind of wants to go, yeah, Aquinas, that objection is the right objection, right? Right. Problem evil. Yeah, we can suggest it. But maybe we don't need to press that issue. It just seems like I'm just going to latch on onto that. And you know, if, if if two theories explain just as much, believe the simpler theism and naturalism explain just as much. Naturalism is simpler. Go with that, right? And then you come in and and you really challenge both of those uh, sort of uh, critical assumptions that they're not on uh, an explanatory par. And it, at least it's not clear who comes out in the simplicity debate. Is that a fair summary before yeah. we dive in? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Great. All right explanation all right this is this is this is the big one and uh, you you can see your sort of leibnizian background <laughs> coming into play here you have a really unique uh really interesting way of kind of presenting a contingency style argument can you take us take us through that maybe we'll we'll start by yeah. diving in here mm -hmm. yeah so um maybe a little bit of the like autobiographical bit might be helpful so Please. i'm reading all these historical people right and then i'm reading contemporary philosophers like uh, timothy o'connor and, and so on and and in these classical sources, they always say that one of the advantages of the argument from contingency, the why is there something rather than nothing argument, over the first cause argument, mm -hmm. is that in order to make the contingency argument, you don't have to prove that the world has a beginning in time. Right. Right. So uh, Maimonides and Aquinas, these people, they say, you know, the Bible tells us that the world has a beginning in time, but we can't prove that philosophically. And so if we're arguing against atheists, we can't assume it. And so instead, um, we're going to say, uh, even if the world has a beginning in time, still we can prove the existence of God. But then these contemporary philosophers presenting this argument, they say that the argument from contingency still has as its conclusion that there's a first cause understood as first in time. Um, so there's, so the like distinction between the two types of cosmological arguments is blurred. Mm, mm -hmm. And so I was wondering what could these historical people have in mind that is really different than positing a like first in time cause, like as if God is kicking off the big bang or something. Right. Flicks that first domino type of thing. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking the historical concept of cause is way broader than the concept that we have now. Uh, yeah. And the like Greek and Latin words that they're using, it basically refers to any answer to a why question. So it's so it, by cause we mean a, a reason. Yeah. And so what we really need is whether the universe has a beginning in time or whether it does not. Nevertheless, there's a, a reason for why the totality of the universe is as it is. And I was helped by Leibniz here because at one point he does say, I think in on the ultimate origination of things, he says. Uh, though eternal things don't have a cause, they must nevertheless have a reason. Mm, mm -hmm. And and so the um, so what kind of reason could that be for the totality? Well, the concept in contemporary analytic philosophy is called grounding. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so you might think that something like um, the existence of a statue is grounded in the uh, kind of existence and arrangement and properties of the clay that it's made out of. Or something like this. This isn't a causal explanation. It's some kind of um, what it is for the statue to exist mm -hmm. explanation. Or a uh, you know a sandwich exists because a piece of meat is between two pieces of bread. Uh, that doesn't cause the sandwich to exist. It's like what it is for the sandwich to exist. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's called grounding in contemporary analytic philosophy. And so what I said is some. Um, Look, there's this thing, I, I call it history with a capital H. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is it's a great big event that consists, that's put together from all of the instances of causation. So A causes B and B causes C, and you put all the causation together. And it's this big event history, the total causal sequence, past, present, and future. And by and by cause in in uh, causes in history, you are saying this is the more restricted understanding of causing of of contemporary philosophy. Right. Right. Yeah, right. So I'm I'm thinking of cause for me is a scientific concept. So I'm right. thinking of the sort of like when they talk about the principle of causality and general relativity that says causal influences can't propagate faster than light. Mm -hmm. Right. This is 
um, the kind of causal influences that we find in, in the sciences or the kinds of things I'm talking about with causation. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of total sequence, maybe it goes back forever and forward forever. Maybe it has a beginning, maybe it has an end, whatever, no matter what it's like, it still makes sense to ask, why is it like that? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so that's the thing that I say, you need something outside the causal sequence to explain. Right. And that explanation can't be necessitating because the causal sequence could have been different. Mm -hmm. And that's the the kind of explanation that the naturalist just isn't in a position to deliver. Right. So the, the idea here is here's at least something and something fairly significant, it seems, <laughs> right, that crucially calls out for an explanation. I think that's a key mm -hmm. consideration. This is really something that stands in need of an explanation. But in principle, this is not something that a naturalist of really any any flavor, at least any flavor that's competitive with theism, could right. give an explanation for. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's 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 unpack that a little bit. I mean, I guess maybe the first thing is 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 yeah. Why, why think that this needs an explanation, right? Why 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 think that we need to go further beyond a, a big H history, as you call it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so. Um... Leibniz has this great example, right? He's about uh, about Euclid's elements. Mm -hmm. This you know geometry textbook that had been in use for many centuries by the time Leibniz learned geometry from it as a, a child. He says, um, "So the copy of of Euclid's elements that Leibniz had was copied from another copy, and that was copied from another copy, and and so on, right back to Euclid, um, who wrote the first copy." Um, so since there's a first copy, obviously there needs to be an explanation of how and why it was written, right? That that you could kind of figure that stuff out. Mm -hmm. But suppose there wasn't a first copy. Suppose Euclid copied it from another copy, and that was copied from another copy, and so on forever. Mm -hmm. We still want to know who proved the theorems, right? Like where? Why is this book the way it is? There's so why does it have a bunch of valid proofs in it and not invalid ones? Right. Or why is it about biology or something? Right, right. Um, so, so that's the like. No, we need to explain it. And Leibniz is thinking. Leibniz is a determinist, so he's thinking we can read each state of the universe off of the preceding ones, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But, but even if that's the case, that's like the copies of the book, right? Mm -hmm. And and so we're still gonna like why this whole eternal universe is the way it is, and has the stuff in it that it has in it is still going to be a sensible question. Yes. Yeah. And and certainly we all have that intuition, right? I think we'd have to kind of clash against a very, a very deep seeming, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. To deny that it just seems like this is something that really does crucially call out for an explanation. And I think getting getting the context here is is important because you're not arguing from the principle of sufficient reason, really in any of its forms in this argument. Rather, you're just saying, look, it seems like me, Dr. Pierce, and the naturalist agree that we should at least explain things as far as we can, right? We, ag we agree on that. Well, here's something that seems like we should we should explain it, and it seems like the theist can at least at least go a step further than the naturalist on something that really stands in need of an explanation. And PSR aside, whatever you want to think about that, within the context of this conversation, that's significant. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah. And at the, the end of the day, I do argue that actually there's a sense in which theism leaves nothing unexplained so that we end up with a version of the PSR as a conclusion. Yes. But yeah. I don't use it as a premise. Yeah, let's. Uh, I'm, I'm a big PSR guy, so you're not going to like any quibbles about me with the PSR. Yeah, yeah. I'm fully on board with that anyways. But I, I like this move because it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's just important to kind of like situate what sort of conversation we're having. And we, if we've already agreed that we should explain that we need like that we should explain things as far as we can. And if the assumption is that um, two theories on are on an explanatory par, you're ch you're challenging that assumption with this. Mm -hmm. Right. But I do want to talk about uh, explanations because it does it does. I guess there's there's two ways you could think about it. Right. Is that you could just say, well, look, this is something that crucially demands an explanation. Theism can get us further than naturalism. Uh, but then we just park out in a brute fact, just like the naturalist would. But we should accept the brute fact here rather than there because of all these other criteria and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. right? That's fine. Uh, I'll say I, I, that that's fine, but that's that wouldn't satisfy me, right, personally. No, it seems, it seems to me that if there are um, facts that are not self-explanatory, 
And if I'm going to avoid a sort of radical skepticism, I do need to get to some sort of self-explanatory fact. And then it does make sense to ask, well, what sort of thing <laughs> could possibly be a self-explanatory fact? And you've got some really cool ideas on this in the book. So maybe start taking us down that route. And, yeah. and let me know if you agree or disagree with what I just, just said as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. so, so we should distinguish between facts that are literally self-explanatory and facts that are autonomous. Yeah. Which is a term I borrow from Shemik Dasgupta. Um, the, so if, if a fact was literally self-explanatory, it would explain itself, and then we'd have a cycle of explanations. Um, so, so I think I take self-explanatory to be a little bit more perhaps metaphorical in the sense that kind of the fact that there's no more explanation needed besides the fact itself. I, I agree. So I guess if you think of explanations always map with sort of uh, extrinsic efficient causes, then nothing could be self-explanatory. But I'm thinking self-explanatory more in the way that a Bernard Lonergan would, as something that's sort of like completely intrinsically intelligible, that if you could grasp its essence, there would be no more mystery, which seems to map on with the idea yeah, of autonomous right. so, so the um, so I borrowed this this distinction from uh, Shemek Dasgupta between um, autonomous and substantive facts. Mm -hmm. So a, a substantive fact is just one that stands in need of explanation, and an autonomous fact is one that doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so the his formulation of the PSR, which I also endorse, says that every substantive fact is fully explained. Um, now, what would it be for a fact not to stand in need of explanation? It would have to be some kind of a mistake to ask why it obtains. Mm -hmm. And I think this Gupta is very plausible in saying that um, the best candidates for autonomous facts are definitions. And, um, and so I, I follow him in appealing to a traditional distinction between two types of definitions, nominal definitions and real definitions. So we're more familiar today with nominal definitions. Nominal definitions tell us the meaning of a word, right? They tell us what, what a word means. Um, nominal definitions are, of course, arbitrary. And in a certain sort of sense, they can be explained. That is, we can explain how the word came to mean that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you ask why all mothers are parents, there's, there's some kind of a mistake involved in that why, right? There's, there's a confusion going on, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, you, you haven't understood what's meant by mother if you're, you're wondering whether all mothers are parents. So that's fine. Um, but the real work needs to be done by, by real definitions. And the kind of traditional claim is that a real definition is not a definition of a word. It's a definition of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, what would it be for things rather than words to have definitions. Well, it would be a, a statement of an essence. It would tell you what it is to be that that thing, um, what it is to be water or horse or whatever. And, and this, is, this is a formulation from Aristotle, the what it is to be of a thing is the essence. Some people nowadays find that notion a bit suspicious that it's, it's kind of some, some sort of heavy metaphysics. But I think we really can't do without it for either science or common sense. Mm -hmm. And I like this sci a science example that I like is that um, physicists know what the words dark matter mean, but as of right now, nobody knows what dark matter is. Mm. And that last, like what it is to be dark matter, what sort of thing dark matter is, right? That's, we don't know. Um, and this is kind of all over the place, right? And, you know, water is H2O was discovered by chemists and not lexicographers, right? You don't, you don't go kind of examining usage of the word in, in English to learn that. Um, and so these are the sorts of things that we mean by real definitions. Um, and the claim would be that although they stand in need of justification because they're not, um, they're not conceptual or analytic truths, right? We need to provide some evidence, some reason for thinking that those are the correct real definitions, they can be wrong. Mm -hmm. But um, what they don't stand in need of is explanation. Once we've, once we've established that they're, they're true, there is no why. Um, that's, that's just what water is. Right. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So that's, that is clear to me, but uh, again, I'm, I'm broadly an Aristotelian, so you're not going to get much, <laughs> much pushback on, on this point, but this is good because it sets the ground uh, uh, sort of, for what we're going to need, I guess, to sort of cash out explanations in this sort of ultimate 
autonomous fact, right? Which is the theist is going to uh, claim as God. So yeah, help help motivate for us. Why why think that that we can end explanation there? And and really, what you're trying to do, and I think this is right, and this is really what kind of veered me towards theism in a large respect, was it does seem like we need to get brute facts to zero for many reasons. Like that just, it does seem to be something we need to do, right? The consequences of not doing that just seem too high, high to me, right? Can a worldview get brute facts to zero? And you, you suggest, yeah, it seems like theism might actually be able to do this. So long as we, we have this idea of an autonomous fact handy and some other moves that we can make. So yeah, lead us down, down that path if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we've got to do is ground everything in autonomous facts, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it would be to reduce the, the brute facts to zero. And so the suggestion obviously is somehow to ground history in God. So, um, Leave aside the details of how that works, because that's not the hardest part, right? Mm -hmm. um, the hardest part is why God doesn't turn out to be uh, a brute fact, the existence right. and nature of God. Um, and here, I think um, we're making a we we end up making a move that um, that maybe is not uh, not where we wish we were in terms of um, our optimism about everything being intelligible to us puny humans. Um, but, but, um, we can make sense of the notion of a being whose essence involves or implies existence. Um, that is, uh, that, that the existence of a being of a certain being might be an autonomous fact or follow from an autonomous fact. And we can see this by looking at some of the versions of the modal ontological argument that have been proposed. Yeah. So the, um, the modal ontological argument says um, possibly God exists necessarily. If God exists, then necessarily God exists. Therefore, God exists. Um, and I might just have, have to ask readers to trust me that according to the system of logic for possibility and necessity that Graham and I and most contemporary analytic philosophers accept, accept that right. argument is valid. It is. Um, the, the modal logic around that is is tricky and i i try to explain it for beginners in the book but it it's tricky yeah but the important uh, part is at least graham agrees that it's valid right right uh, he agrees that it's valid um now in terms of that second premise why would you think that necessarily if god exists then god exists then god necessarily exists why would you think that mm -hmm. people have proposed these various definitions that that would follow from um like a being having all perfections, and then they argue that necessary existence is a perfection. Um, or one of the things you get in the classical tradition is that um, a, a perfectly simple being would not admit of the distinction between essence and existence. Right. Um, and so it would just have to exist. Um, and uh, and there are other examples of definitions, and so. What I think this shows us is that kind of we can think of various coherent looking definitions, real definitions that have this consequence of, yeah. of existence. The next problem though is the classical problem for ontological arguments raised by Ganilo, the, the lost island problem. Mm -hmm. So Ganilo responding to Anselm said, um, look, the lost island is a, an island than which none greater can be conceived, but existing islands are better than imaginary ones. Um, and so the lost island exists. Or Catarist responding to Descartes gives a similar, like, I'll just define the concept existent lion. Right. Yeah, all these parody attempts. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so what goes on here? Well, I think the key is we're talking about real definitions, not nominal definitions. Mm -hmm. So we can't just make them up however we want. But that also means that we might be wrong about their really about that really being a a possible essence. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Especially since we don't we don't grasp it, obviously. Because if we did, we wouldn't be asking this question. <laughs> right. Well, and so there are interpretations. Both Anselm and Descartes, at least some interpretations, think that you know it might not be a coincidence that both Anselm and Descartes write in this kind of meditative form, and yeah. Anselm is writing in a kind of prayer. Right. And and some people think what's going on here is that actually they're just leading you through some kind of series of spiritual meditations 
mm-hmm. that if you do them right, then You'll the existence see. of God will become so blindingly obvious that you can't deny it. Yeah. And the like logical argument isn't really doing any work. I've I've spent a lot of time with with Descartes especially, but also with Anselm, and I don't have that experience. Yeah, so, you know, I, apparently, you know, do you remember? Uh, just not to get too sidetracked, is I think like sometimes I feel like I'm I'm like Bertrand Russell on this because I think there's a famous, uh, well known quote for him where yeah. one time he was like skipping down the street and he's like, "Holy mudcats! The ontological argument is sound," but then right, like right. he he lost that feeling like a moment later. I, I feel like I've been there honestly. Like sometimes it just seems like I get this flash and it's like, oh, it is. It is sound, right? But then I, but then five minutes later, I've I've lost right. it. So, <laughs> right. So, so I mean, so Thomas Aquinas says um, that the existence of God is not self-evident to, but well, it's not evident to us, right? right? It's evident in itself, but not to us. And the reason it's not evident to us is that we don't grasp the essence of God, mm-hmm. um, because we're finite and we can't grasp that kind of infinite essence. And there are various other arguments here. And so, you know, one way of putting what I think Aquinas is saying, at least the the view that I kind of have taken from him, um, is that uh, his is that there is a va- there is a sound modal ontological argument, but God only knows what it looks like, <laughs> um, right? Because because in order to see the soundness of that argument, you'd have to grasp the essence of God, which only God uh, does, which, which only God can do. Um, but what we can do is we can see this notion of a being whose essence includes or implies existence Mm -hmm. makes sense. There are various competing candidates for what that essence might be. And we perhaps don't understand any of them perfectly. And we don't know which one is right. Some of them are inconsistent with one another. You know, there's a, there's this evil God parody of the ontological argument, right? That like a a being in which none worse can be conceived. Well, obviously like a a real bad thing is worse than an imaginary bad thing um and and so the um so if you think about it from that perspective um then some of these definitions are inconsistent with one another the beings like can't both exist so the idea is is that just like scientists are willing to posit entities that will make the theory work yeah. and make the theory succeed in explaining the data. They hypothesize them. Um, we can similarly hypothesize that there is a being whose essence includes existence, although we don't understand the essence. And we can kind of try to attribute various features to that being based on the role that it needs to play in order for the explanatory theory to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what's going on when we're kind of making this this inference to God um, as a being whose essence includes existence, we say, um, although we don't grasp that essence in a way that would allow us to see how it includes existence. Yeah, but what you're doing here, and I think this is right, this is actually something that I w- was thinking about a long time, and I got really excited when I, I saw your your presentation of it is opposite the common objection that the cosmological argument depends on the ontological argument. You're saying, if anything, it's the reverse, right? Where, right. where, where the skeptics typically try to, um, yeah, dump out of the ontological argument isn't that they challenge, challenge its logical validity in, in its contemporary form from Planiga on. It's just that they, they say there's no way you're breaking that possibility premise, right? There's a stalemate right. there, or we can run parody attempts. But you're saying, well, look, if we have an independent contingency argument, we can just plug that into the first premise, and then this gives us reason to accept, you know, what traditionally comes out of the ontological argument, which is say like a perfection at the absolute bottom of reality, which then, of course, would would sort of give us the, um, uh, yeah, that entity that we need that could reduce yeah. brute facts to zero. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and so so I think this is what a lot of the classical tradition is doing, right. Um, is that they're in order to provide the kind of ultimate explanation that the cosmological argument seeks, mm-hmm. the being that we infer would have to be the sort of being who could figure in a modal ontological argument. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. And and so we kind of infer that we can't explain reality unless some modal ontological argument is sound. But but if we don't know which one is sound and we can't show that it's sound except by means of the cosmological argument, 
then the ontological argument isn't playing any role in establishing the existence of God. But it might play some kind of role in explaining the existence of God or in kind of building the um, building up the, the theistic metaphysical theory yes. in a satisfying way. Yeah, I think that's a really, really cool insight, right? It's like by itself, okay. And and look, there's still a number of people who are willing to go to the mat on the ontological <laughs> argument. I, I'll admit I haven't been convinced by it, right? And I just read uh, Dr. Uh, Nagasawa's book, Maximal God. Yeah, Intriguing, sure. but I'm still I'm just still not convinced by it. I'm I'm just I'm, I'm just not. I'm, maybe it's just too too much reading Saint Thomas, and maybe this maybe too much of a skeptic. <laughs> However, undeniably, it does seem like it can at least play this type of role. And in that sense, it's that's really that's a really fruitful thing. That's a really cool yeah. thing. I, I love that. Now, um, there is a, a I guess a point of contention in the book, and this is a common one, about like if you still have bruteness somewhere, right? And the classic one it relates to contrastive explanations and free will. Now, I think the um, what's really helpful, certainly in the Thomistic tradition, is like it's well once you understand what the nature of the will is right? And the nature of finitude and this or that, right? The will just is the power to make efficacious any sort of finite good, right? So so you can kind of just say a, a sort of parallel thing that if you got that, then the why question is is kind of, uh, you know, a, a marker of confusion, right? You haven't really understood what the nature of the will is. Uh, and, and, and then you give a nice uh, response, I think, of uh, around the objection from contrastive explanation but then you just say it's not really a problem in this debate because graham and i could could both sort of adopt this position either way i don't know if you wanted to say anything about those points at all but it's something that commonly comes up you know mm -hmm. right so i mean i think this is a really deep problem actually and i one of the things that i kind of have been most thinking about and a lot of my kind of more technical journal articles recently are on this sort of topic mm -hmm. is about divine and human freedom. And in particular, it's important that God's decision, that God explain history by means of a free and rational choice. And that's important in order for it to be fully explained without taking away contingency. Right. Trying to avoid that modal collapse there. Mm -hmm. Right. But that means that, you know, we need to think that God's um, choice is is compatible with contingency and so we can't go with well we have we need to avoid the thing that leibniz spends a bunch of effort trying to avoid and probably doesn't succeed at the, the view that um the the view that necessarily god chooses the best of all possible worlds and that god couldn't make any other choice right. and that's um, that's what o'connor sort of goes with actually Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, um, he, he does sort of seems to take the Leibnizian of. optimism a bit in a, in a new way. But uh -huh. so if you so take a, um so I just there's this I contribute to a symposium on on a paper by O'Connor in the forthcoming edition of Oxford Studies in Philosophy of Religion. Mm -hmm. um, you can take a look at on this. So O'Connor does want to think that um, God has a, a great variety of worlds that are genuinely possible for God to actualize mm -hmm. um and i'm worried about whether the kind of strategy that that o'connor and mark johnston and others have have tried to use uh really works for that um so there's um yeah so so i just um i i like there's a paper by alexander Proust on um divine creative freedom yeah it's a good one mm -hmm. that yeah that i think is kind of um I guess I'd say the most promising approach I've seen mm -hmm. uh, that wants to rely on incommensurable goods. So he thinks that just like beauty and sensual pleasure are mm -hmm. can't be compared to say whether one degree of the one is as good as one degree of the other or whatever. Um, and so we can kind of explain God's choice in terms of the goods that God appreciated, the reasons that God appreciated. But given precisely the same reasons, God could have made a a different choice and it still would have been fully intelligible. Um, so this is the kind of general approach that seems most promising to me. And, I, and it's the one I kind of suggest in the 
in the debate. But I, I really, I really consider this an unsolved problem. I have to say, you take a sort of Mysterian approach here at the end of the day, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, well, I would. I don't. I don't want to be a Mysterian. I just haven't solved the problem to my own satisfaction. So. Yeah, you know, it's 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 you know maybe we can have you back on to just talk about that uh, in particular because it's one that I've I've thought a, a lot about myself. And one is like, what what is the direction of explanation? Is a thing to consider, right? Is it from cause to effect, effect to cause, right? That's going to factor into a lot of this, right? Mm -hmm. How can we break down the propositions? Like, are there really contrastive facts? I don't think there are, right? And mm -hmm. and and you agree yeah, yeah. with that as well. So, kind of how you even think about what an explanation is and what is required of an explanation, that alone, I think, can alleviate it enough to still get you what you want of theism, bringing brute facts down to zero. But it, but I think we still want to go deeper, like you're saying, right? And and try and probe the nature of, right. of the will and rationality and how it's linked. And I like what you say about Proust. I've I've been uh, very much always attracted by, um, like, Yves Simone on stuff like this and, and freedom of choice. It would be, be fun maybe to do a separate conversation on, sure. on that because it's, it's a thorny one, to be sure, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so what else haven't we um, said about your contingency argument at this point? Um, so I think we've hit the main the main points of the contingency argument. The idea is, so I think uh, created objects are grounded in history, which is the mm -hmm. complete sequence of causes and effects, the, the complete se sequence of causal events. Uh, history is is grounded in in God's choice or God's will, which is grounded in God. Um, something that um, something that some people have have found interesting about how I'm trying to make sense of these grounding explanations. So I I think of um, God's willing as explaining history and maybe something like the way that the uh, motions of the dancers explain the existence of a waltz, mm -hmm. and and. Something about these analogies is that it, it makes sense of the notion of God holding the universe in, in being. Mm -hmm. And it has kind of a, a satisfying account of divine power in that it's thinking that the kind of the universe is being as it is, is nothing over and above God's willing. Yes. It's right. that, that God is, is kind of enacting mm -hmm. the universe or history understood as an event. So that's the kind of dependence on God that, that, exists in the the version of the argument that i uh, put forward yeah excellent really really good and i think it's a really cool novel take on um on yeah on 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 really what what has sort of been there in the tradition you're but you're articulating it and refining it i think in a in a really important way as it as it lands in contemporary debates of of theism and naturalism you have another interesting argument really interesting argument really an epistemological argument can we explore this one a little bit, Dr. Sure. Pierce? Yeah. And uh, yeah, let me see if I can try and summarize it. Then I'll let you 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 kind of fill in the details. And it's this idea of like, hey, we can't we can't go with Descartes on epistemology, right? We can't we can't start from this position of of global doubt, right? We'll just get we'll just get stuck in this sort of radical skepticism. So we have to start from a position of at least just trusting our faculties is generally reliable until we have reason to to issue an exception or, or whatnot, right? That all seems perfectly right to me. And it seems like uh, that's not something many naturalists would disagree with or need to disagree with, right? And then you're asking the question, okay, well, what, what theory sort of best supports that posture, right? What theory is sort of best lends to uh, or would best predict the general reliability of our cognitive faculties? And you kind of tie that really nicely into religious experience. And then you say, okay, well, I'll ask, considerations equal it seems like theism is the, the better theory for this not a definitive proof but it seems like a consideration however strong in favor of of theism over over naturalism is that is that a decent summary yeah <laughs> well so i i do want to make a kind of distinction here that yeah. a lot of people who including thomas reed himself who's kind of the the guy this approach to epistemology is generally comes from um a lot of them endorse a, a providentialist epistemology that are thinking that we need to say that kind of God created us and, and wants us to have true beliefs uh, in order to explain the general reliability of our faculties. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't make that kind of argument. Yeah. Um, and I don't think atheists have too much trouble explaining the general reliability of our faculties. There's some questions about kind of the nature of mental representation and causal theories and, 
there, there's some puzzles there, but yeah, I don't think it's too bad. The big thing that I want to say is a, is the thing about religious experience mm -hmm. that there are these sorts of experiences that are in fact widespread throughout the world. Um, experiences of of spiritual realities or or of you know oneness of the universe or of what people take to be God, whatever. There are these sorts of experiences. And it seems like the um, the atheist um, is going to have to say that these are are pretty much just hallucinations, mm -hmm. and and this is unfortunate because all of us we kind of we kind of start with this principle of the general reliability of our faculties, and the more kinds of complicated weird exceptions you're having to carve out from the general reliability the kind of uglier and more convoluted your theory is getting. Right. And also, since reliability is the kind of default starting point, claims of unreliability require justification. Now, where this argument gets tricky, and this is something Graham and I have a lot of back and forth on, is that nobody can say that all or even most of the beliefs people form on the basis of religious experience are true. Right, because they, con they conflict. Mm -hmm. They conflict, uh, but similarly, nobody can say that all or that all of the beliefs that people form on the basis of sensory perception are true. People form all kinds of false beliefs, right? Moral moral beliefs as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So so there's a question about kind of can we take that sort of um, spiritual perception, if you want to call it that, as a general as a generally reliable faculty. Mm -hmm that um, kind of goes wrong sometimes in something like similar ways that other faculties go wrong. Yeah. Um, or do we have to say that this kind of whole mechanism that is a pretty widespread part of, of human experience uh, is all just a, a kind of mistake? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I'm claiming is that in terms of our general epistemology, in terms of having a consistent approach, across all the different kinds of human experiences, it would be better if we could say the, the former thing. And that's true, especially because, as William Alston argues at great length in this, this lovely book, Perceiving God, um, from the perspective of epistemology, it's actually really hard to identify any significant difference between religious experience and sensory experience for um, kind of in terms of how we interpret it to form beliefs, in terms of the way in which our interpretation is shaped by culture and prior beliefs, mm -hmm. um, in terms of it just being kind of a widespread part of human life, it's it's very difficult to kind of show that yeah. this sort of religious experience is, is different from sensory perception in a way that matters. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's spend some time on this because this is really cool. And I think there's a number of tensions that, that you pick out. One is um, <clears throat> from the naturalist perspective, I guess, is one of my problems has always been this problem of arbitrary breaks, right? And this, I think this is what you're getting at, right? Now, may, maybe you don't think it would be an arbitrary break. And, and what by arbitrary break, I mean succumbing to Darwin's dilemma, right? That the universal acid of the evolutionary theory kind of changes or corrupts everything it touches, right? And the idea here is that acid... Uh, corrupts religious belief. Why? Because religious belief was just a sort of delusion we formed that helped facilitate cooperation and survival. But it's it's not it's not real, right? It's no real religious facts, right? Uh, okay, but how then does that acid not burn through our moral beliefs? And even if you're an atheist and think that there are necessary moral truths, which Professor Oppie does, right? How are you now securing? moral knowledge of that right it does it doesn't seem like we have a reliable process there so now it just seems like we have a real stark arbitrariness at the very least like even if we're still granting moral facts on naturalism which certainly i think can be challenged it still seems like we have just like a real jarring arbitrariness here why not just let the earth's acid continue to burn right and 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 we do have you know modern uh computer simulations and evolutionary uh theory uh, that suggests that evolution could even drive political perceptual experiences to uh, to unreliability, right? So we actually have some some evidence to think that it might even be arbitrary uh, to to count, uh, you know, our, our basic most what seems to be most obviously true uh, sense experiences 
as reliable as well. So you see, see what I'm saying? This, this problem of arbitrariness yeah. always struck me with naturalist theories. Yeah. So, so I tend to think, I, I tend to think, um, you know, that uh, planting this evolutionary argument against naturalism, which is this, this famous claim that kind of if completely unguided evolution is true, then all of our belief forming faculties aim only at usefulness for at evolutionary fitness and not at truth. Um, I, I kind of think um, that doesn't um, necessarily apply kind of really broadly to evolutionary naturalist views, perhaps not so ambitiously as planning it thinks it does. But one of the things it does show is that people who make evolutionary debunking arguments should be careful that the debunking doesn't spread out of control. Because um, once you start thinking that that line of reasoning debunks certain classes of beliefs, mm -hmm. there is a where do you stop problem. And I do think you're right that this problem is especially pressing for someone like Graham, who believes in objective, um, mathematical, moral, and aesthetic facts that are not kind of um, naturalized. So, so some people would would uh, some people give definitions of naturalism that would exclude him because he believes in in non natural moral and anesthetic and mathematical facts. Right, and they're just they're just they're they're just brute necessities. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, and they're also they have no ontological basis either. So there are there are new there are mathematical facts, but there are no numbers on his view. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, there's no ontological grounding for them. They're just, just true. And then there's this question about like, how do we know them? And in particular, would, you know, why would we think that an evolutionary process would, would enable us to know them? So, um, without kind of like, those are big, difficult philosophical problems, but the, but the thing is, once you've endorsed that, then you can't say, well, I can't trace this knowledge to the way that my senses interact with the environment, so it must not be legitimate, because you've already accepted a bunch of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And and so the fact that religious experience um, doesn't have this kind of obvious story about causal interaction with the environment that explains kind of knowledge production mm -hmm. Um, well, there's a lot of stuff that a lot of naturalists are committed to that doesn't have that. And, um, and you know, I, I think you can kind of tell a naturalistic story about why you would think that evolution would produce generally reliable faculties, particularly if you think that, you know, it's no accident that moral behavior often conduces to survival and different things like this, right? And it's no accident that true beliefs about whether there are berries over there often conduces to survival. Yeah, but but right there, is that is that true? Because we see fratricide and severe inegalitarianism all through the animal kingdom. Sure. Right? Right. So, so that's so, that's where I think like Plantinga might be onto a little bit more. Uh, you know. Sure. So I mean, so I say it's so so I so you have to say something like it's no accident that it generally conduces, right? Sure. Uh -huh. And and um there are lots of views that that might deliver this. For instance, if you've got like Graham has sort of a broadly Aristotelian view about uh, where the moral facts are connected with facts about flourishing, yeah. about what it is for an organism to flourish. Mm -hmm. Now, flourishing is not the same thing as evolutionary fitness, mm -hmm. um, but it's not kind of mere coincidence that what we call human flourishing often conduces to evolutionary fitness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because if, if you like, like, you know, people who are near starvation don't have a lot of offspring and um, people who kind of don't have, you know, you might think you might actually think that kind of family life itself and bringing up your children and having meaningful relationships with them is part of your flourishing and part of theirs. And you might think yeah. that that's something also is likely mm -hmm. to lead to survival of the individual in the community. And, and so on that kind of flourishing view, I think like, you can kind of see that it's non-accidental that there that there's kind of a general connection between that sort of thing and evolutionary fitness, even though there are kind of particular cases in which strated in which other strategies um, turn out to be beneficial. Right. Yeah. So my my problem is not, I guess, that there might be the general conduciveness, right? But the process 
by which we would have knowledge of the correct moral facts, right? And how easily that process could have gone wrong, right? That does seem to me to be a serious problem well, that I've never been able to consistently think my way my way through from the yeah, yeah. So, I mean, look, right, yeah. the, the naturalist has a problem about why we get things mostly right. And the theist has a problem about why we ever get things wrong. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It, yeah. hundred percent. Right. Because for the yeah. theist, it's well, yeah. OK, sure. If, if there's sort of perfection at the foundation and we've and we've got the teleology we need. Yeah. OK. Uh, doesn't seem too hard to imagine how God could you know, providentially guide the evolutionary process to creating beings with generally reliable faculties. But then how do we go wrong? Right. That's it. Like what, how and why and why? Why? Why would why would we go wrong? So the theist does have a story to tell there. Right. And you've and you've so, got and you've got one, right? Yeah, and so yeah. actually, you might think I might I might tend to think that um, a view with um, an evolutionary view with a god who isn't engaged in constant meddling, um, actually, you might think is I I would tend to think does the best where you're thinking that um, kind of God designed the laws of the universe. Right. And cares about us having true beliefs and flourishing and, and having good things happening and so on. Um, but the kind of consistent application of simple laws in this lovely evolutionary way, because evolution is both beautiful and horrible, right? In in that it like there's all the it's shot through with all this pain and suffering, but it also produces like glorious and beautiful complexity from very simple starting points. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if, and so if you're thinking about kind of God doing that thing and doing it kind of by setting up the general laws rather than constantly intermeddling, which is how, which is what I do. Yeah. I yeah. Yeah. So, th so then then you might think, well, well, that explains why um, our, our faculties are generally but not perfectly reliable. Yeah. Yeah. And you also talk about uh, how a lot of our disagreements really are in the level of interpretation as well. Right. Um, and I think that's an important, a really important consideration, too. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I, I argue at length that the kind of most plausible view for the theist to take, even a theist who's committed to one religious tradition being right and the rest being wrong, still the most plausible thing to say is that uh, nearly all of these religious experiences are really encounters with God. Mm -hmm. And the kind of disagreement in the beliefs we end up forming about God are matters of interpretation. And that there is so much interpretation going on and that the, the kind of interpretation is learned and it's cultural is actually the same with sense experience. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I, 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 that, that's a super fascinating part of the book. Obviously we've only scratched a little bit of the surface, but part of this conversation is to entice people to go read and, and, and buy the book. All right. I want to try and hit one more thing before our time is up and maybe we can only give a sketch. And that is uh, the considerations of simplicity. Um, and again, we were talking about behind the scenes, and this is, you know, this is where um, I always struggled even back when I was sort of would have considered myself a naturalist. And I still struggle with it now is it seems naturalism has this this problem of sort of defining its own boundaries, right? Like, what is a natural thing? Please, somebody tell me. And you you'll you'll have two different naturalists that both claim that they're naturalists, but it seems like they're living in two totally different Right. paradigms reality is like one might be a sort of ontological or, or or priority pluralist and and whatever else mind is it comes really late in the game that that sounds more like uh, professor oppie's view and you'll have another naturalist it's like a cosmo psychist so they're a priority monist and mind is like right baked in somehow and then i think but they're both naturalists but these things seem like they're just wildly different right um Help help me think through this, Doctor. What, what am I missing yeah. here? What's, yeah. yeah. So I think the kind of um, it seems to me the thing that's kind of tying all the forms of naturalism together, or that's kind of a a slogan or, or generating the family resemblance, is about not going beyond science. And so if you look at at Graham's view, Graham's version of naturalism, the most recent version. He's not going beyond science with respect to causal entities and causal powers and is causation. That's what the not going beyond science is. Now, that's interesting because my version of theism doesn't require you to go beyond science in those ways either because God isn't a cause. God is a ground. Hmm. Um, so then he's got this other clause about, um, about uh, mind being late and local. 
that that is kind of a separate thing that helps distinguish it from theism or rule out theism. Um, but I think the general motivation behind all the different forms of naturalism and that kind of ties them together is this idea that kind of science is the most successful set of methods we have for making sense of the world. And we can just stop there yeah. and not do anything else besides what we're doing in science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just read a lot of naturalists that just don't seem like they would fit into that picture or that, that they would just be excluded from the team. And I think that might actually be right, though, because sometimes I read a lot of naturalists. I'm like, are you like a pantheist? Right. <laughs> so maybe, maybe you're actually a theist of some broad stripe. And there's just yeah, some of this, I guess, is just maybe it can't be solved. So we just have to stipulate, OK, here's what we mean by naturalism for this right. conversation. But if, and, that, if and, that, that, and yeah, and that's what kind of makes these debates hard is like, you know, maybe you can argue against one form of naturalism. But if there's I don't know if it's like if it's like Ben and Jerry's yogurt and it comes in all these different flavors and stuff, I guess, what do you have to do? You just got to kind of take it piece by piece. Right. Yeah. So so, I mean, here's a classic argument for panpsychism. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it actually goes back to Margaret Cavendish in the 17th century, but was independently rediscovered by Thomas Nagel in the 1970s. So, uh Humans are, uh, you know, humans have minds or are, are minded entities, as Graham would rather say. Um, and we're made out of matter and completely made out of matter and nothing else. Just any matter could end up making a human, which means that kind of just any matter has the potentiality to be a minded entity. Um, but we can't totally explain mentality in terms of kind of non-mental features and, and nothing could kind of arise from those, and it couldn't arise from those non-mental features, you know. And so it must be that kind of the mental features were in the matter all along, and it's got to be now all matter because any matter could end up composing a human. Mm -hmm. um, now, that kind of panpsychism, which could be connected with cosmopsychism, if you think there's some reason to think that kind of all the minds add up to a big mind, yep. that kind of panpsychism is coming from a naturalistic motivation. Mm -hmm. That is, it's thinking that kind of the mindedness of humans, the psychological features we have, that that's something studied by science and try to explain it is something science does. And these concepts of matters are, matter are kind of sciencey concepts. Mm -hmm. And um, and this kind of um, explanation that we're doing, trying to make humans an ordinary part of the natural world involves attributing some surprising features to, to the natural world. Now, you might think that's, that that involves bad science, Right. Or that it like is as many naturalists themselves do. Right. Right. Or that it's going beyond what like the actual scientific experts in those actual fields think. Right. Or, yeah. you know, so you might think that's like a bad version of naturalism. Sure. But you can see how the kind of motivation for that particular version of panpsychism, it might might seem like a naturalistic motivation to someone trying to kind of integrate mind into the natural world rather than making it something separate. Yeah, and that's that's a, that's important context. I mean, for me, it's just these 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 terms tend to be so elastic, right? And that's that's mm -hmm. part of like even science. Like, yeah, we study human minds, but like most most you know most of the naturalists I read would say like things like subjectivity, right, is not a something that like we get at through mm -hmm. science, right? Hence the hard problem of consciousness, yeah. which is some of the some of these motivations. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess that just does that does that solve the problem or does it relocate the problem, right? Of just the, the stretchiness of naturalism just now becoming stretchiness of science. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, well, I think that's why almost any of these like big picture isms in philosophy, like physicalism yeah. and idealism and naturalism and theism, uh, they're all pretty stretchy. And they have some kind of um maybe shared motivation or maybe you could put like a loose fuzzy slogan mm -hmm. you just got to look at how each philosopher tries to make it more precise yeah mm -hmm. um and that does mean that like no one argument is going to be an argument against everything that could reasonably be called naturalism yes right or theism as well or right yeah, yeah because and to, yeah, we have to be fair many different brands of theism many brands of theism that i reject <laughs> right well, right and um, yeah and so these kind of big picture isms whether you're arguing for it or arguing against it mm -hmm. you're gonna have to employ some kind of definition that is going to rule out some things that kind of reasonably go under that name 
And that, and yeah, and that's it. To me, it's like I read, I read a, a number of. I'm not saying this is Professor Oppie. I think he's he's very clear that his naturalism excludes and is competitive with theism. But there's other naturalisms that I think I don't see this as being competitive with or excluding theism. Yeah. Necessarily. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and there's some naturalists that um, I think are giving flawed definitions because I think they would want to rule out my view, and they don't. Yes, yes, uh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> but but there are also cases like, you know, like different kinds of methodological naturalism maybe are actually intended not to beg the question against theism, right? So the like we should posit supernatural causes only as a last resort when all the natural causes have been ruled out or so, something like that is you know, there are some of these other things that go under the name naturalism that aren't meant to to rule theism out initially. Yeah. Okay, so the reason I wanted to spend time on that is it seems relevant to this debate about simplicity. Right. And in many ways, right, like whether you think you're positing something new by God kind of depends heavily on what you think a natural entity is versus a supernatural entity. Right. So it's like some of these things are really hard to solve without having these these underlying deeper level discussions. So maybe you can at least just help us scratch the surface of how you think about the, the simplicity debate. Yeah. And so when I'm thinking of the kind of explainer that the cosmological argument needs and saying that it can't be a that the naturalist can't have it. I'm saying that there's kind of no entity and pattern of explanation that you would find in current science that mm -hmm. would do the trick. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, but, you know, future science is up for grabs, right? I don't know. Sure, yeah. Um, but um, in, terms of the, in terms of the simplicity issue, um, what I'm saying is that kind of positing a, a deeper level that is kind of below the most fundamental stuff studied by science um, we can explain and unify the totality of uh, the causal sequence studied by science. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we can do that in a, a way that involves a, a being who is quite simple. Um, I'm not sure I understand the uh, kind of full strength divine simplicity doctrine that we get in the medieval classical theists, but yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, a, I'm a fan of that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we can get, I, th I think we can get something sort of close to it. I'd like to get all the way there, but I'm just not sure. Yeah, it's funny. I just made a meme called the Help Me Understand Divine Simplicity Starter Pack. And I had a bunch of books by like Barry Miller, but then also a bottle of Jack and a an Advil as well. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, the uh, so it's that's pretty tricky. But but we can kind of explain and unify the world with this this sort of quite simple being. So, yes, we're positing something that the naturalist doesn't accept. Um, there's a question about how much different it is from stuff the naturalist already does accept, mm -hmm. especially if, um, like, Graham agrees with me that we can't give a conceptual analysis of mental state concepts in physical terms. Yeah. Um, and so we already kind of have the concepts involved as part of our unanalyzed conceptual vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, and we're uh, and and we're kind of positing just one entity at the fundamental level rather than having a plurality of entities at the fundamental level. Uh, and so we're kind of explaining and unifying things. So on balance, are we making the simplicity situation better or worse? Um, well, it's I mean, it's not really clear, right? When you you posit a new, more fundamental level to explain or unify the stuff you were already committed to, explain and unify mm -hmm. the stuff you were already committed to. Is there an additional cost and complexity? Um, this gets into kind of really tricky questions about, about how we're measuring and comparing complexity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I certainly want to say no, <laughs> right? In terms, of, in terms of like just elegance or syntactical complexity, if we can just have, say, pure actuality or perfection, right? It seems like right. the theist is pretty advantage there, right? Because whatever the natural is going to have to do, they're going to have to have sort of imperfection at the root or compositeness. And that just seems like you're, you're not going to be able to match that level mm -hmm. of complexity. They could probably match quantitative complexity on the fundamental level if they are a priority monus of some sort, but then I don't see them matching qualitative uh, complexity, right? It still seems it's going to be qualitatively right. more complex. Um, but I don't, maybe I'm missing something, but it, um, Professor Oppie it, it seems... And, and you call this out too. It seems like he's committed to just a lot of fundamental uh, entities, right? And he might actually have a lot of costs there on the fun, yeah. on the fundamental level in terms of complexity. So maybe spell out what one of your criticisms. Uh, yeah. I mean, so, so he's actually, he, uh, he was, he's really uh, was pushing hard to nail me down on all kinds of things that I'm not, 
real sure about, right? Because I'm, I'm a philosopher. I have a lot of doubts. But um, but then he never quite gets clear on what he takes the fundamental stuff to be. And there's a certain amount of, well, the physicist will tell us. Um, okay, but then why can't I say, well, the theologians will tell us? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, the, right. So, so the... Um, at the fundamental level, I guess he's got quantum physics, right? And and so maybe we've got a plurality of quantum fields, or maybe we've got the individual particles, depending on how you're interpreting quantum field theory. It doesn't seem like he's going the Jonathan Schaffer route with space-time priority monism and saying that at bottom we've just got space-time, mm -hmm. um, uh, or the wave function of the universe or something like that. He seems to think something like there's a, a plurality of quantum particles or something like that at the at the bottom metaphysical level yeah um and that does seem kind of uh that i mean that seems to me like it might be significantly more complicated than god especially if you've got kind of different particle flavors and and um you know the different properties they have and then they've got the, these kind of weird indeterminate properties and um but it, i mean at least it's enough that he can't just say because what he wants to say to me is, you believe in everything I do and then some. So obviously I win on simplicity. Um, and what I at least want to say is, it's way more difficult than that to make this simplicity comparison. Right? Yeah, right. Especially since you have different ways that people think about simplicity, like syntactical simplicity and stuff like that, right? Like which which one matters most? Is there any one that overrides the others? And like on what level does simplicity really matter? And I agree with you. It seems like it's the fundamental level. That, right. that that really really matters and if we can get even just a stalemate or even an increase in simplicity but then all that explanatory power and and um and yeah and if it's not ad hoc and and all that i guess just by the various inductive criteria right. i think theism has a really strong case uh there as well do you have time for a question or two from the audience here dr pierce yeah absolutely excellent is there anything else you want to actually say because we've been talking a lot about your view was there anything else that you think about Specifically, since you're in dialogue with him, Professor Oppie's view of naturalism that you found sort of unsatisfying in terms of explanation, maybe with his uh, theory of morality or mathematics or anything like that. Right. Well, so I'm I'm really kind of his idea that necessary truths can't have explanations other than by stating that they're necessary. Um, it just seems totally bizarre to me, and and not like something that a that a naturalist ought to say either in terms of scientific and mathematical practice and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we, his, his view of kind of interlevel metaphysics about how we talk about more or less fundamental things is a bit puzzling as well, because he wants to deal with that just in terms of kind of possible worlds, which is something that almost all grounding theorists think doesn't work. Mm -hmm. because um, the singleton set Socrates exists necessarily if and only if Socrates does, but the singleton set depends on Socrates and not vice versa. Yeah. Um, and so we need more kind of machinery than that. Um, and this whole thing led to kind of a bit of um, uh, confusion that we might have sorted out uh, if we had had another round mm -hmm. about um, the, the euthyphro problem. Yes. Um, so the, the problem of whether things are right because God likes them or God likes them because they're right. Um, the uh, I thought, because he was trying to do all this stuff just with possible worlds and nothing else, that he was thinking that the grounding stuff was unintelligible. Mm -hmm. Because that's what most opponents say um, to that view. Um, and if it's unintelligible then the um, kind of euthyphro problem itself is unintelligible. Right. So there is no euthyphro problem. Right. Right. Um, but, and and there is some question about whether, like, I think the thing you're saying is unintelligible, but I can say the words that, according to you, mean something, and if you're right, should make a problem for your view, right? So mm -hmm. you might still be able to, um, to make that work. But that's how that went. And then he kind of came back later and said, oh, no, I don't actually think that's unintelligible. I just think that I don't need it from a simplicity perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so I think he's, he's wrong about, about not needing it in terms of what kind of interlevel metaphysics you need to make sense of the scientific view of the world.
Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And I'll let, we'll encourage people of course to, uh, in fact, let's, let's, let's do that right now before we take uh, gentle listeners. If you're here live and you have a question for Dr. Pierce, please submit it now. Uh, in the meantime, let's just um, show the book one more time. And Dr. Pierce, where would be the best place to get a copy of, is there a God, a debate and any of your other worker books you want to mention, please uh, put in the plugs now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that one, um, that one uh, you can order direct from Routledge uh, and it's available. It's also available from all the major ebook providers. Mm -hmm. um, this, so Routledge.com is the best, the best place to order that one. Um, my, uh, my other books are more, uh, kind of, uh, academic and, uh, and, and technical, less lame aimed for popular audiences, but, uh, language and the structure of Barclay's world about the 18th century philosopher, Bishop George Barclay, mm -hmm. um, available from Oxford university press. Um, and I've also edited idealism, new essays in metaphysics with Tyrone Goldschmidt, which is also available from Oxford university press. So you can find those at oup.com. Great. I will link all those in the show notes. And uh, what's what's the next project that you're working on? Anything? Uh... Sure. So I've been I've been working on a, a book called uh, tentatively entitled uh, Barclay's Religion, a study in the history of Anglican philosophy. Oh, cool. So, yeah. So I um, in my previous work on on Barclay, I got kind of interested in the religious context of his thought. And I thought that the scholars who are working on him are not paying enough attention to the complexity of the debates that are happening within his church. Mm -hmm. They tend to think it's kind of all Christians versus deists or something, as though the Christians have ever been all on the same side about anything, right? Right, right. So, so um, that that kind of uh, led me to this, this uh, deeper exploration of kind of his philosophical theology, but also how it relates, how his philosophical theology relates to ethics and politics and that sort of thing. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. Great. Well, that will be uh, hopefully an occasion for another conversation. All right, let's uh, let's grab a question here. This one comes from Andrew. He says, what do you guys think about the argument from desire? And could cognitive science of religion be a helpful supplement mm -hmm. for such an argument? Yeah. What are your thoughts on this, Dr. Pierce? Yeah. So I, I suppose you're thinking of this, this argument that um, if naturalism is true, then humans would have a, a necessarily unfulfilled desire or a desire for something that, that wasn't to be had in the world. Uh -huh. Um. I'm not sure whether naturalism predicts that there would or wouldn't be such desires, right? So people used to make that argument in the in the Middle Ages based on an Aristotelian scientific picture where this kind of slogan, nature does nothing in vain, right. was, was taken really seriously. Um, but uh, of course, on a, a Darwinian evolutionary picture, there are some traits that persist despite not having a role in fitness. And there also may be desires that increase fitness somehow without ever being fulfilled. So um, might cognitive science of religion help? It's it's conceivable that it could. That is, it's, it's conceivable that when we worked out all the details of that um, infinite desire, that there might be something in that process that favored theism somehow. Um, I... Definitely don't know, so, well, especially not in my state of knowledge about the cognitive science of religion, um, but perhaps in, in humanity's general state of knowledge at present, I'm not sure that um, such an argument could be made really compelling um, at present. Yeah, excellent. Well, I yeah, I'm on the same page with you. I think it's an, it's an interesting thing to think about, but it's not... Uh... Yeah, it's a it's a, a suggestion maybe or something. I don't <laughs> I don't know. I've never been. Um, in fact, I was just talking about that with some some students uh, the other day of say, hey, well, look, if, if theism is true, then that's nice because it seems like these desires could be fulfilled. <laughs> right. But that doesn't necessarily prove that theism is true. But uh, right. it's it's kind of cool. Uh, Dr. Pierce, thank you so much. Um, before we hit the off button here, um, you have a website and a very excellent blog. Would you mind mentioning that so people can keep up with your work and, and anything else you want to tell people about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, KennyPierce.net is the website. That's P-E-A-R-C-E. -E. Uh, it's probably on your screen right now. And uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at Kenneth L. Pierce. Excellent. Thank you so much, everybody. And 